Namaskar, welcome to this series of lectures on principles of construction management. And what we have been talking about is construction safety and we have gone through material which says that well, of course, an accident is unacceptable. We should also understand that in case there is an accident, all efforts should be made that there is minimum loss of life and property. So coming to this effort which is concentrated on the minimizing of life, minimizing of injuries to workers, the personal protective equipment which is the subject matter of discussion today plays a very very important role. So what we will do today is talk about the different personal protective equipment that is used and what is the roles of the employer and what is the role of the employees and so on in our discussion. Before we start our discussion on the PPE or the personal protective equipment, let me acknowledge the Occupational Safety and Health Administration whose booklet is largely the basis of our discussion today. And it is very interesting to note that as part of this booklet, it is clearly written that material contained in this publication is in public domain and may be reproduced fully or partially without permission. Source credit is requested but not required. Whether it is requested or not, I would like to acknowledge uh, the effort made by OSHA in this direction. And this is a very important and very interesting reference and I would expect or uh, hope that some of you find it useful. Please do go through that. So now coming to our discussion, the first step as far as minimizing the damage due to an accident is concerned is controlling the hazard at its source is the best way to protect the employees. So if somehow we are able to ensure that the accident does not happen, the hazard is controlled at the site itself where it is, then the employees are exposed to the minimum danger. Now depending on the hazard or the workplace conditions, use of engineering or work practice controls is recommended to manage or eliminate the hazards to the greatest extent possible. So, elimination of the hazard at its origin is the best thing to do and we have to take engineering and work practice controls and that is what has been part of our discussion so far. Employers are however in addition required to provide personal protective equipment PPE to their employees and ensure its use. So, in the event of an accident, in the event of the injury to a worker, the employers cannot take the defense that the worker did not use the PPE properly. It is the employer's responsibility to not only provide the personal protective equipment, but also ensure that the worker is appropriately and adequately trained for that purpose. So what is personal protective equipment? It is worn on the person to minimize the exposure to the hazards and the injury. So we must remember that the PPE is not an accident prevention measure. It is basically a measure to ensure that the injury is minimized. It is a measure to ensure that the exposure is minimized. Now here is an example of what PPE is all about. So if we see here, so we need to protect the head we need to protect the eyes, the respiratory tract that is the nose, we need to protect the face as such, we need to protect the ears, there is protective clothing which affords overall protection, we need to protect hands, feet and so on. So it depends on what kind of a hazard that you are working with. So depending on that, you can wear hard hats, goggles, respirators hearing devices, gloves, safety boots, full body suits, safety belts and so on. So this is a classification of what these different PPE can be. Now this is just an example of what a good site would do even when somebody comes for a site inspection or a visit. Something like a hard hat, a jacket, hand gloves and a walkie talkie is part of a kit that is kept ready for all the visitors. So these visitors they come take this wear this on their person before they go to the site. 
usually there has to be a small pep talk which trains or educates the visitors as to how to handle these equipments or how to handle any of these gear now coming to the employer's responsibilities the first step obviously is to perform a hazard assessment of the workplace to identify and control the physical and health hazards we've already talked about in the previous lectures that as far as a construction site is concerned depending on where it is located the kind of hazards that a person the worker working there or a visitor is likely to be exposed to are different if it's a marine site or a site in the middle of the river or it is a high rise building it could be a tunnel depending on the kind of environment that hazards involved are different and that's why the first step is to perform a hazard assessment of the workplace and find out what are the hazards that are involved and then only we can make a decision as to what is the kind of ppe that would be necessary so identify and provide appropriate ppe to the employees train the employees in the use of ppe and how to take care of it so for example if it's a helmet or a jacket or gloves it's not enough that these are simply provided the employees must be able to use them and they should know how to take care of them maintain the ppe including replacing worn and damaged ppe so they so obviously the construction sites could work for several months several years sometimes and therefore something like a glove or something like the jackets they may need replacement for whatever reason and it's the employer's responsibility to ensure that they are replaced when requested periodically review update and evaluate the effectiveness of the ppe and safety programs this goes without saying that having made an assessment once is not enough this kind of an exercise has to be carried out periodically as part of a safety officer's job now coming to what the employee's responsibilities are the first responsibility is to properly wear the ppe the second responsibility is attend training sessions on ppe those of us who have traveled in air would know that there is always a standard exercise which tells the passengers as to how to handle a safety belt how to handle a life jacket and so on so it's the responsibility of all workers to make sure that they attend training sessions involving the use of ppe in certain cases it's trivial and therefore it may be done once in a year or maybe once in two years or at the time of induction alone but in certain cases when specialized equipments are involved this kind of training is required to be imparted periodically and the workers must take it seriously clean and maintain the ppe most of the time what is done in sites is that the employer issues the ppe to the workers and it's their responsibility to basically maintain it so it's their lookout that they take care of their equipment issued to them clean it and maintain it and if it requires replacement or repair they should inform the supervisor about it and then it's the employer's responsibility to make sure that it is appropriately either repaired or replaced now coming to hazard assessment what we have to do is to identify the physical and health hazards at the workplace and potential hazards have to be classified into the following categories of course these are perhaps not exhaustive but at least it's indicative impact electric penetration compression chemical heat or cold harmful dust light or optical radiation and biological and so on so depending on the different phases of construction different types of construction there could be different hazards that will come into play as far as a construction site is concerned we must keep in mind that construction sites need not always be new construction sites there can always be work taken up in an existing refinery or an existing atomic power plant and in that case the construction itself though it could be civil engineering but the workers should be protected against any possible radiation and all that we have to carry out the hazard assessment very carefully taking into account the particular construction site or the particular job that we are executing 
Now the workplace should be periodically reassessed for any changes in the conditions, equipment or operating procedures that could affect occupational hazards. So this assessment is not a one time exercise, but as I have also said earlier that it is a periodic assessment is carried out. Continuing, the suitability of existing PPE including an evaluation of its condition and age should be included in this reassessment. So it is important to ensure that the PPE is adequate and is of a certain standard that affords the right kind of protection and that is something which we will come to when we discuss the details of the different PPE. Now coming to the selection of PPE, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that is OSHA requires that the PPE should be meeting or be equivalent to standards developed by the American National Standards Institute. Some of those standards are given here for eye and face protection, head protection, foot protection, hand protection and so on. There is nothing sacrosanct about the American National Standards Institute, but what is being said is that once a PPE is being procured and is being used, it is being issued, it should conform to certain standards, whether it is American or Australian or Indian, that does not matter. It depends on the client, it depends on the contractor, what is part of the contract. This has to be laid down and defined before the job is in fact awarded. So this has to be part of the contract document that well, as far as this particular job is concerned, the contractor shall provide to its workers PPE conforming to such and such standards. So now coming to specific types of PPE or the specific equipment that protect different parts of our body, let us first talk of head protection. We must remember that a head injury is a very, very serious injury and can impair an employee for life or it can even be fatal. Therefore, Wearing a safety helmet or a hard hat is one of the easiest ways to protect an employee from a head injury. What should be the functional requirements of a hard hat? It should resist penetration by objects. So if there is a falling object that hits the helmet, it should resist penetration from that. It should absorb the shock of a blow. It should be water resistant and slow burning. And there should be clear instructions explaining proper adjustments and replacement of the suspension and headband. We will talk about these qualities once again a little later. Now hard hats must have a hard outer shell and a shock absorbing lining that incorporates a headband and straps that suspend the shell from 2.54 centimeters to 3.18 centimeters away from the head. That is an inch to an inch and a quarter from the head. There can be obviously classifications of these hard hats and one classification is A, B and C where class A hard hats provide an impact and penetration resistance along with limited voltage protection up to 2200 volts. In certain cases which is called class B hard hats, they provide the highest level of protection against electrical hazards with high voltage shock and burn protection up to 20,000 volts and they also provide protection from impact and penetration hazards by flying or falling objects. A class C hard hats provide lightweight comfort and impact protection, but offer no protection from the electrical hazards. What we have to keep in mind that even though as far as this set of lectures or series of lectures is concerned is largely concentrated on civil engineering examples and the civil engineering background, a construction site is not a civil engineering site alone. There are several examples where there is very, very serious electrical engineering operation in progress, equipment erection, equipment operations and so on and so forth. And therefore, as a construction manager, one has to be aware of certain things which are not necessarily in the domain of one engineering or the other. So I would leave it to you to find out whether safety engineering is a subject in itself or not and how many universities offer degrees or diplomas is something called safety engineering. Now continuing from our continuing our discussion with head protection, this pictures here show the typical internal structure of a hard hat and the different types of hard hat. And this is the suspension that we are talking about 
the adjustable chin strap and workers should know how to handle it. So it should not happen that for some reason the worker was wearing the helmet but it gets blown away and the worker is hit by a falling object. These are the kind of possibilities which have to be prevented. It has also to be ensured that this strap does not wear out over a period of time or is somehow cut at some place or the other. So then the helmet does not afford any protection and that is something which we need to educate the workers about and they have to be careful about it when maintaining this helmet. Now coming to the eye and face protection, the hazard includes flying particles, molten metal, liquid chemicals, acids or caustic liquids, chemical gases or vapors, potentially infected material or potentially harmful light radiation. What specific examples of this could be welding operations where protective shades act as filters and thus the intensity of light or radiant energy produced by welding cutting or brazing operations is reduced. So this is how we try to protect the eyes in a welding operation. As far as laser operations are concerned, laser safety goggles should protect the specific wavelength of the laser and must be of sufficient optical density for the energy involved. So before the procurement of the protective equipment is made, one has to drop the specifications depending upon the actual hazards and their details. Those hazards and details need to be provided to the safety inspector by the competent engineers and then together they decide what should be the specifications of the PPE to be procured and used at a particular site. Continuing with our eye and face protection measures, this is basically just a chart which says filter lenses for protection against radiant energy depending on the kind of operations that are involved. There are different plate thicknesses and protective shades. We select the laser safety glasses in a similar manner depending on the intensity involved. So this here are pictures about the laser safety goggles or the face shield and the welder's helmet with all the details. And these websites and the internet will help you get more information about the technical details involved. So please remember that design of these PPE is also an important subject that needs to be studied. Coming to hearing protection that is your ears, obviously the louder the noise the shorter the exposure time before hearing protection is required. So for a certain amount of noise which we are all exposed to and we tolerate in our daily lives, beyond that threshold is when we require the hearing protection and depending on the level of that noise, the duration for which we may be permitted to be exposed to that noise is also different. Here is the permissible noise exposure and durations in hours and the sound level in decibels. As the sound level in decibels increases, the duration per day in hours which you can be exposed to reduces. So that is something which we need to keep in mind and beyond this point we need to provide appropriate hearing protection. And hearing protectors worn by employees must reduce an employee's noise exposure to within acceptable limits provided in this table. So that is how we evaluate functional performance of hearing protection. Now this is the earmuffs for hearing protection and appendix B of 29 CFR 1910.95 details the information on methods to estimate the attenuation effective of hearing protectors based on the device's noise reduction ratio or the noise reduction rating. Manufacturers of hearing protection devices must display the device's NRR on their product packaging. So these are the kind of stipulations that are made out when we are manufacturing the PPE and somebody is buying them. Some types of hearing protection includes single use ear plugs made of waxed cotton, foam, silicone, rubber or fiberglass wool, preformed or molded ear plugs or earmuffs which require a perfect seal around the ear. So when it comes to periodic maintenance, somebody has to ensure that the ears of the worker are indeed being sealed. So coming to the hand and arm protection, potential hazards could include skin absorption 
of harmful substances, chemicals or thermal burns, electrical dangers, bruises, abrasions, cuts, punctures, fractures and amputations in the extreme case. The factors that may influence the selection of PPE gloves for this workplace would be the type of chemicals handled, nature of contact, total immersion, splash, etc., duration of contact, area requiring protection whether it is only the fingers or the hands or the forearm or the entire arm, grip requirement in terms of dry, wet and oily, thermal protection, size and comfort, abrasion and resistance requirements. So, this is how we try to quantify the performance of a PPE which is supposed to afford protection to the hands and arms. So, coming to more details of this gloves, leather, canvas or metal mesh gloves, fabric or coated fabric gloves, chemical or liquid resistant gloves, insulating rubber gloves are some of the gloves that are commonly used in construction sites. These are pictures of some of these gloves, the metal mesh gloves or the chemical resistant gloves or the insulating rubber gloves and I would encourage you to look at the internet and try to get a better idea and an understanding of the different kinds of protective equipment that are available not only for the gloves, not only as gloves or hand protection, but also goggles and all that. Now, coming to body protection, in addition to cuts and radiation, some examples of workplace hazards that could cause bodily injury could be temperature extremes, hot splashes from molten metals or other liquids, potential impacts from tools, machinery and materials and hazardous chemicals. And examples of the protection could include laboratory coats, coveralls, vests, jackets, aprons, surgical gowns and full body suits. Coming to some of the specific types of body protection available, it could be paper like fiber used for disposable suits that provides protection against dust and splashes. It could be treated wool or cotton which adapts well to changing temperatures is comfortable and fire resistant and protects against dust, abrasions and rough and irritating surfaces. It could be duck, which is a closely woven cotton fabric that protects against cuts and bruises when handling heavy, sharp or rough materials. Leather is often used to protect against dry heat and flames. Rubber and rubberized fabrics, neoprene and plastics protect against certain chemicals and physical hazards. When chemical and physical hazards are present, check with the clothing manufacturer to ensure that the material selected will provide adequate protection against a specific hazard. What we must emphasize once again, even though I have talked about it when we were talking about safety in the initial stages, a construction site is definitely a hazardous place. That does not mean that construction will not take place. It is important that we understand the hazards involved, take appropriate measures to ensure that even though it is a hazardous place, no injury happens. Of course, the best thing to happen is no accident happens. But the least we can try to do is to ensure that the injuries are minimized. Now, coming to safety belts, lifelines and lanyards, this is what the picture looks like for a safety belt and the text that is given here, I will just quickly read it. Lifelines, safety belts and lanyards shall be used only for employee safeguarding. They should not be used for any other purpose. Any lifeline, safety belt or lanyard actually subjected to in-service loading as distinguished from static load testing shall be immediately removed from service and shall not be used again for employee safeguarding. So, if this particular PPE has been actually subjected to some loads that should be replaced, it should not continue to be used. Lifelines shall be secured above the point of operation to an anchorage or a structural member capable of supporting a minimum dead weight of 5,400 pounds and lifelines used on rock scaling operations or in areas where lifeline may be subjected to cutting or abrasion shall be minimum of 7 8 of an inch wire core manila rope. For all other lifeline applications a minimum of 3 4 of an inch manila or equivalent with a minimum breaking strength of 5,400 pounds shall be used. So, the language used here is shall be used or it shall have certain specifications shall be immediately removed. So, this is how the specifications are written and it is important or it is imperative on the contractor to 
follow it in letter and spirit. Continuing with our discussion on safety belts and lifelines, safety belt lanyard shall be a minimum of half inch nylon or equivalent with a maximum length to provide for a fall of no greater than 6 feet and the rope shall have a nominal breaking strength of 5400 pounds. All safety belt and lanyard hardware shall be drop forged or pressed steel cadmium plated in accordance with type 1 class B plating specified in the federal specifications such and such and surface shall be smooth and free of sharp edges. All safety belts and lanyard hardware except rivets shall be capable of withstanding a tensile loading of 4000 pounds without cracking, breaking or taking a permanent deformation. So obviously we are using in this discussion today the FPS system. We are talking of inches, we are talking of pounds and I am leaving it to you to do a small exercise of converting these to the standard SI units and of course the fact that they have been borrowed largely from American standards is the reason why these have been retained in inches and pounds. Now coming to the foot and leg protection, leggings protect the lower legs and feet from heat hazards such as molten metals or welding sparks. Metatarsal guards protect the instep area from impact and compression made of aluminum, steel, fiber or plastic. These guards may be strapped to the outside of shoes. Toe guards fit over the toes of regular shoes to protect the toes from impact and compression hazards. They may be made of steel, aluminum or plastic. Combinations of foot and shin guards protect the lower legs and feet. Safety shoes have impact resistant toes and heat resistant soles that protect the feet against hot work surfaces common in roofing, paving and hot metal industries. The metal insoles of some safety shoes also protect against puncture wounds. There are special purpose shoes, electrically conductive shoes provide protection against the buildup of static electricity, electric hazard safety toe shoes are non-conductive and will prevent the wearer's feet from completing an electrical circuit to the ground, foundry shoes insulating the feet from extreme heat of molten metal keep the hot metal from lodging in the shoe eyelets, tongues or other parts, these snug fitting leather or leather substitute shoes have leather or rubber soles and rubber heels. And these are pictures of some of the shoes and foot protection equipment which are often used in the industry. Now coming to the training of employees about PPE, the employers are required to train each employee who must use PPE and the employees must be trained to know at least the following when PPE is necessary, what PPE is necessary, how to properly put on, take off, adjust and wear the PPE and the limitations of the PPE. The employees have to be told and educated that wearing the PPE does not protect them from all hazards. There are limitations depending on the type of PPE being used. Proper care maintenance, useful life and disposal of the equipment that has to be a part of the employee training. The employer must document the training of each employee required to wear or use the PPE by preparing a certification program and the name of each employee trained, the date of training, a clear identification of the subject of the certification. So this is more like record keeping but that is something which is very important for a construction site which may have a thousand people working. So it is important that as part of the induction program before the workers are allowed to go to the actual construction site they go through a basic induction program which may cover just the fundamentals of protection and then have more specialized programs and training sessions depending on the actual environment where different workers are working. With this we come to an end of our discussion today and you might find some of these references useful in understanding the subject matter covered today better and I look forward to seeing you again in this course. Thank you. Mm -hmm.